Uh, thank you very much for coming. Yeah, I'm here to talk about uh, Seago and uh, performance. Um, just really quickly, uh, can I get a show of hands? How many people actually know what Seago is? Okay, that's good. How many people know m about Seago anything beyond Seago is not Go? Okay, getting less there. How many people have used Seago to call C code? How many people have used Seago to call Go code from C? Oh my God, all of you people, I want to talk to you later. The ones who left your hands up at the end, I really want to talk to you. I wish I'd known who you all were like several months ago. Um, yeah, very much so. So um, in this talk, yeah, I'm going to talk about, um, well, basically a very personal experience for uh, learning Seago. Um, a little bit about myself real quick there. I am the VP of uh, Engineering at Wallaroo Labs. You'll hear more about uh, what we do at the first part of this talk because otherwise what I set out to learn and do probably wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, most people when I was uh, talking to them the last couple of days at the conference, I would tell them exactly what I was talking about and the question that came from everyone was, why would you want to do that? So um, we'll get on that. Um, uh, that's where you can find me on the internet. If you follow me on Twitter, I'm just going to warn you ahead of time. You'll mostly get tweets about music and not so much about uh, computers. Um, so, what's in this talk? Right, well, um, at, the, at the start of this, it's really going to be some context with uh, look, my background and the assumptions that I brought into working with Seago and what I expected for how things would work, et cetera. Um, so a lot of the things that I'm going to mention potentially as things that I found surprising or weird or odd, uh, somebody with a different background might not, might not find. Then I'm going to talk really about uh, a bit about Wallaroo, uh, the product that I work on that led me to doing all this work, and how Wallaroo works with Go. Then I'm going to dive more into, for anybody who's not familiar with it, some, some basics of Seago, and then get into uh, Seago performance overhead, um, and then start talking about Seago and pointers, because that's where the fun really starts. And um, well, from there, we're just going to kind of roll on through a bunch of confusing code into an end where I'm going to ask people to make life easier for folks who come later on so they don't have to go through um, what I and a lot of other people I've talked to learn Seago do. So uh, me and Seago. Um, so I probably spent a lot of my career gluing different languages together, um, doing lots of stuff with what uh, people would com commonly call FFI, that is a foreign function interface, where from one language you need to call something that's in another, you know, like calling Python from C or C from Python. Um, a large portion of the 90s, I did a lot of stuff where uh, we wrote extensions into Perl um, or called Perl code from C++. I wrote, I wrote a bridge that allowed you to call um, Java code from Perl and Perl code from Java um, and be able to have the objects communicate with one another. Wow, I never actually thought about how messed up like a lot of the work I've had to do is. but. Um, yeah, that's there we go. So um, also, um, I would call myself a C programmer. Um, when I stop and think about computing problems, I think about how is this laid out in memory? How am I going to point at that memory, et cetera? And a lot of my expectations for how computer languages should work are really based on how C works. And early on, a lot of my expectations for how C worked were really based on the fact that I first started learning as a fourth programmer. If anybody knows what fourth is, it basically probably twists you and gives you a weird view on languages. So um, I'm also a pony programmer. Um, most folks don't know what pony is. It's a uh, high performance actor based language uh, designed to make it, um, well, easy to do unsafe things safely. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it at that for now, and we can get to that later. Um, you could probably call me a Seago programmer at this point. Um, I know an awful lot about um, Seago. I've spent more time studying like the Go runtime and how Seago works than I have uh, actually writing uh, Go code itself. Almost all of the Go code that I've written um, was in support of doing something with Seago. So, from that, um, 
I don't think anybody would call me a Go programmer. Um, I asked uh, Brian Kettleson at one point to take a look at some of the stuff that we had written. And he was like, wow, this is really technically cool. And you aren't Go programmers. You don't, you don't, really, you don't, you don't know the idioms here. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't consider myself a Go programmer. I am learning more as we go along. But if there's weirdness in, in my Go code, Find me later, because I'm interested in it. But it's, it probably looks like Go code that was written by somebody who called himself a C programmer. And so yeah, I ended up here on this stage because uh, Waluru Labs, we needed to, uh, we needed to glue uh, Go code together with uh, Pony code, in particular, call Go code from Pony code. And uh, Brian, uh, when I was talking to him about it back in February, was like, that sounds like a great talk. Why don't you submit that as a talk? So was, and if it hadn't been for that, I definitely wouldn't be here. Um, it would never have occurred to me to come get up here and speak to a bunch of Go programmers about Seago. Um, so Wallaroo, the why of, of why I did all this. Um, so Wallaroo is, uh, it's, uh, we call it scale-independent computing for Go. Uh, we have a preview release of a Go API, which led to the, uh, this. And, uh, and we also have Python as our main supported one. Uh, you could call. Uh, Wallaroo, a framework for doing big data stuff, right? Like if you, if you started thinking in the general space of Hadoop, Spark, Storm, Flink, Kafka streams, et cetera, you'd be at least in the right ballpark. Or even better, if we wanted to get clearer on that, it's a framework for horizontally scaling like event by event stream processing applications. And so okay, we could drop Hadoop and, and Spark off of that more along the lines of like Storm, Flink, Kafka, these sorts of things, except not JVM based at all, right? And uh, what Wallaroo allows somebody to do is to, to write the specialized bits of their code that you would need for a stream processing thing. And Wallaroo nodes then uh, can form to get, come together to form uh, ad hoc clusters of the same application to be able to scale them up and down, to move state around amongst a number of processes in order to handle whatever the workload is that you might have. And there's a two-layer architecture uh, that we implement uh, in Wallaroo. And the, the top layer um, is what we call our scale-independent layer. This is really what a user uh, ends up writing. This is where the Go code, in the particular case in our stuff, comes from. And then there's a, there's a scale-aware portion of it, which is really the, the code that uh, myself and my engineering team spend most of our time working on. This is where all the distributed systems, wonderfulness of how do you replay messages, how do you form clusters of stuff, what do you do in order to recover from failures, et cetera. Um, all of that happens. And there's, there's an API which, which glues all of this together, right? So that, that I, as the user, can write this scale-independent code, which will run on this, uh, on this scale-aware platform, right? And so, Wallaroo and Go. Let's, I'm, I want to dig into that a little bit more, because this will hopefully explain like, where uh, Seago comes into this, except for some folks who probably already guessed by this point. So um, if you can imagine this, this big box here, uh, it's like there's our Wallaroo one time, and I have this, I don't even know what color that is, but it's the big arrow that's running through it. Like we have some data that's flowing through there, right? And the Wallaroo runtime is responsible for handling this data and moving it through. And at different points along the way, we're going to need to do some type of processing for any given application. And so these bits right here, the ones that I have circled, these, these are things that you as an end user, if you were using Wallaroo, would write in Go using our Go API, right, to like, hey, we got some data that's coming in over TCP or something. I need to decode this. There's some computation that I would do on this. Like, I don't know, hey, we got strings coming in. I'm going to reverse the strings. You know, not the most exciting thing, but you get the idea, right? And then there's like, there's this interchange of data going back and forth between the two things. And this is where Seago comes in because uh, what we actually do when we do this for our Go API is that the, the, the Go code and the uh, and R code, which is not Go code, it's Pony code, gets compiled together into a single binary, right? Um, and we use Seago's uh, uh, lib archive in order to do this with the Go code. And then you go through like, uh, the Pony compiler, which links it in as though it was a C library, et cetera. And so you have all of this stuff that comes together in a single binary, right? And, and so if we were to go back and look at this two-layer architecture like this, right, this, uh, the scale-aware portion that we have here that I was talking about, that's, that's the Pony code, right? And this, this scale-independent portion 
That's, that's our Go code, right? And, and the API bit that we're really talking about, that's, that's, where, that's where the Seago is, and that's really the part of what I'm going to be talking about for the rest of this, is what happens in the Seago bit, and how can, we, how can we bridge between the Go code and the Pony code, and in particular, what are the problems that you can run into if you're trying to do this sort of thing, right? And that really, that ends my, my Seago backstory, right? So a little about Seago for the couple of people who didn't raise their hand for, oh, I know what Seago is, right? Um, Seago allows you, as I've, as I've intimated earlier, it allows you to call C code from, from your Go code, right? Um, and also, in a less commonly used uh, approach, you can also call Go code from, from C, where your Go code is a library which can be used by other languages, right? Um, so. One of the expectations I had when I came in and we first started looking at, oh, we're going to do a Go API, is I was like, oh, OK, C Go, this looks like a foreign function system like I'm used to. And, and under the technical definition of it, this is certainly a, a it's, it is an FFI system. It, it allows you to call Go code from some other language. But there are certain series of affordances that I ex to somebody who has a C background, where like I would expect that an FFI system would have minimal overhead in terms of the of the amount of how expensive it is to call between the two different languages. I would um, I would expect um, well I would expect that being able to handle and deal with memory that needs to go back and forth across the border would be relatively straightforward to do, and there might be something like the way uh, Python handles this by giving you some sort of reference counting thing that you can do or whatnot. And it's not any of those things. I was, I was very surprised by that when we got into it, right? Um, and then the other thing, which, is, which I also then got to learn from it as well, um, from uh, David's post, is that Seago is not Go. And, and I read that post, and I was like, oh, OK. Like, in, in the post, for, for folks who are not familiar with this, is basically is that, yeah, there's an awful lot of things that make Go really nice. Uh, there's, there's a nice tool chain for this that allows you to do build static binaries. You can cross-compile for one platform or another. All of this, there's some really nice tools in order to analyze for uh, data races, for you can check out your performance and everything. You don't get any of those with Seago, basically. Seago really is, it's, it's not Go. Like, it's, hey, this looks just like Go, but most of the ecosystem that people would expect is just not there. And the performance can be really surprising, what, you, what you'd get, right? Um, so usually, from, from, from what I would expect from a background, is, is that when you have an FFI system, like as I said, um, is that it's, it's fairly inexpensive to call from one thing to another. I mean, like, calling one C function from another is, you know, a couple nanoseconds at most in terms of overhead. Calling, um, calling C code from Python is, it's measured in single-digit nanoseconds in order to do this and going the other way. And it's, it's just kind of an expectation that most people who come from a C background have for this. This is not at all the case with, with Seago. Um, uh, basically, C and Go live in two, effectively two entirely different universes, and there's a lot of work that has to be done in order to cross over from those. Like, like Go routines have, um, they have these growable stacks, which in the C world would just be, you'd just be like, wait, what? The stack does what? And, and, and there's a bunch of housekeeping that has to be done in when you're, when you're going to cross from, from one direction to the other. Um, and so this ends up having overhead. And even if I told you about this, I think at least a few people are going to be surprised by some of the numbers that are here. So um, uh, calling C from Go. Uh, this one, when I first came across it, it's, there's a Cockroach DB uh, blog post called The Cost and Complexity of Seago, where they cover a number of the things about like issues around build tools, et cetera. But the primary portion of the post is that, hey, there is overhead uh, to, calling, um, to calling C from Go. So if you look at these, this is, this is from uh, their benchmarks, which I then ran and got similar results. And uh, calling one Go function from another, you know, they had about call it two nanoseconds of overhead per operation for this basically no op function call. There's, there's just enough there so that it wouldn't get optimized away. On the other hand, if you're calling C from Go, it's basically 100x 
higher, where it was about, in their case, it was like 171 nanoseconds um, for that, which, eh, depending on what you're doing, that may or may not be bad, right? It's certainly a lot higher than what I, would, than I was expecting. The, um, going in the other direction, where you're calling go from C, this is, this is a lot worse. A lot worse. And I, I want to be clear here, though, because it's not, it's calling go from C really means, OK, I have a thread that was started outside of the go runtime, and I am now going to be calling into the go runtime. And there's an awful lot of work, even more than what you have to do when you're going the other way for setup that gets done. Um, some of the points where, the, where it goes through the setup uh, is basically effectively going through things that operate as locks so that these numbers can get even worse as you start to scale up the number of threads that are trying to do this. Um, and even worse can be kind of bad because, yeah, those, those are milliseconds, not microseconds or anything there. Um, I tested this on a variety of things. I had a, uh, somebody on the uh, Seago go for Slack test for me as well. On basically on Linux, on all the different machines in AWS that I tested, it was about one to two milliseconds of overhead for every single one of those calls. And on my nice little trusty 2014 MacBook Pro here, it was five to six milliseconds of overhead for each one of those calls. That's really, 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 really high. And I'm one of those people who's just like, OK, I can't just let that pass, right? I need to understand what's going on here, right? So I spent a lot of time, and I ended up here at line 1771 um, in runtime proc.go. You can't really, well, actually, it's nice and big up there. You might be able to read this. Uh, the gist of there's a to-do that's right here that's been there for several years in the Go runtime. And basically what this says is, hey, we're going to do all of this work every single time. Every single time you make a call, we're going to do this. And then we're going to throw all of the work that we did away for this because, because this thread might only do this one time, and we don't want to leak any of these resources. And there's a really nice to-do here, which basically says that, hey, we should probably have a thing where we can keep this around as a thread local, so you only pay this cost on the first time, really. And then after that, it wouldn't be there. And you can have some type of exit handling thing, which would go ahead and tear this down so you don't leak resources on it. And there's also a really nice note somewhere in here where the person says that the cost of this probably isn't too high or whatever. Um, it might not have been very high when this was first done. I mean, there's been a lot of changes that went on in the Go runtime um, since then. But it's definitely a very expensive thing that, that uh, happens now. Very surprising when I found it. I, also, at the same time, though, it made me laugh. Like, how many times have you like tried to track down a bug like in your own code, and it finally ends up at some place that says "to do highly unlikely edge case scenario that will happen"? Right? Well, it's it. I sort of had the same feeling in there. So, yeah, this is this is a this is a definite problem if you're looking to like get performance and to use Go as a library um, and call it from C code. Right? So. There are a couple recommendations in general just around uh, this overhead stuff, which is that you really want to batch your Seago calls if you can. Um, and you should know this going into it because you could have potentially backed yourself into a corner with how you design things where going back through and batching your calls might be really expensive. Not that I know anything about that at all. Um, so. You know, what this means is really if you're calling from Go into C, uh, try to do as much as you can in a single C call. Um, this is probably me going to mean that you're going to do some ugly things that you don't really want to because you're going to send. Ideally, it's just like, oh, hey, I want to do this one thing. I got a bit of data here. I might have an array of, of things. And I want to, over each one of these things in a collection, I want to do something with it inside a C. That might be effectively what you want to do, but you're going to pay a really high cost if you do that. Instead, you're going to want to take all of that data and ship it into the, like, the one C call, and then write a lot more of your stuff in C and keep like, the minimal amount that you can at that interaction point and go. Um, the same thing goes for if you're calling from uh, C into Go. Is, and it's even, even something you want to do even more here, right? Is you want to batch those calls together as much as possible, send as much data through in order to avoid that overhead. Because that is, yeah, that is some pretty high overhead. Very, very, very painful. Um, one more. 
I don't, know any, I don't know about anybody else, between the hotels and the altitude here, I'm just like drinking water constantly. The fact that I just went 20 minutes is probably the longest since I got here Sunday that I've gone without a drink of water. So, uh, pointers. I want to talk about pointers. Um, um, and a lot of problems that you will run into if you want to use uh, Seago with C. Um, but before I can really talk about pointers, I need to talk about my favorite topic, which is garbage collection. Well, it's maybe it's not my favorite. It's probably my second favorite, though. I'm not being facetious on that. I love to talk about garbage collection. I ended up talking about garbage collection over lunch today because I just can't stop. So first thing is, is that when people think garbage collection, they think generally of some type of uh, mark and sweep garbage collector that operates in a stop the world fashion, like, um, like uh, the JVM does. But that's not actually necessarily the case. Here, in particular, I want to talk about one type of garbage collector, which I'm giving my own term for, um, in a way that would cover a number of things. And that, that, is a, that is a copying garbage collector. This would be a garbage collector that moves things in memory as part of the garbage collection process. Um, if you're familiar with Erlang, for example, as a language, Erlang takes all of its memory on garbage collection and copies everything from one place to another in memory. So if your Erlang application needs one gig of memory, you actually have to have two so that you can copy. Um, oftentimes, you'll have garbage collectors which uh, want to be able to free memory and compact things and move them around, et cetera. Um, this, is, this is a thing that some people uh, think is a good idea for garbage collectors. In some cases, it might be. In some cases, you know, not. It really depends on what you're really trying to achieve there. So, um, the issue is, is that any of these copying or relocating garbage collectors will make things a lot more difficult if you're doing any sort of FFI thing with languages which involve sharing memory. Because effectively, you can have uh, me like, here you go, see, here's a pointer to some memory. Um, oops, by the way, when I did garbage collection, I moved it on you, and you have no way of knowing that this happened, right? Um, and then bad, bad things will happen. You will, you will seg fault, you will crash, etc. cetera. So um, Go does not have a garbage collector at this point in time that relocates memory. However, a decision was made that they might want to be able to have a garbage collector that does this at some point. So in, uh, as of Go 1.6, it was introduced that uh, C is no longer allowed to hold on to, uh, to Go pointers, like in between function calls. So I can't, for example, uh, call into some user's Go code, have it create like a string and return a pointer to that string back to me, and have the C code hold on to it for use later on. Right? That's, that's not going to be allowed. And not only that, but violations of this will be checked um, at Runtime, uh, you can go into the you can go into the runtime. You'll find it. It will panic if you try and do this, right? Um, and with that panicking, you know, a lot of bad things will happen. These are the four big basic rules um, around this. This is from the Seago page. I think I copied this verbatim. Um, pretty much, basically, it it just says no. You cannot share pointers between uh, between Go code and C code. Unfortunately, you know. You probably, you probably need to do this. We certainly did at Wallaroo. So we spent some time looking into this, trying to figure out what do we do here? How do, how do, we, so, how do we solve this problem? Um, and somewhere, I don't know where it is, but on some mailing list or some blog post that I've never been able to find again since then, somebody suggested, oh, just stick everything in a map. Right? And you can have a key in your map, which is like an integer, and then you'll be able to get anything you want. I don't, I don't know who wrote this blog post, but honestly, I'm not sure how long if they hadn't written that blog post, it would have taken us to come up with this idea, because we were looking at it like C programmers, and we were mostly just scratching our heads, spending most of our time more going, what? Why, why do I have to do this? You know, that's, that's a, it's like a background thing. Right? So yeah. Go isn't allowed to return these, these non-pointers to C. And this big old map of integers to Go objects can solve your problem, right? Um, you could have something that looks like this. This is like a slightly simplified version of it, right? I like my little type there. It's big old map, right? And, and what we really have inside there is we, base, we, have, we have a map 
there that's, you know, from our UN 64s to interface because, you know, we need to store potentially different things in there. There's, there's no generics, et cetera. So we use, an, we use an interface, right? And then in order to make sure that this is safe, where we can like, have multiple like, calling threads uh, that want to interface with Go, um, working with this, we, uh, we have a mutex around it where we, we're going to lock and unlock at the beginning of each one of our operations. And um, we're also going to have uh, uh, UN64, which is going to be our identifier, where we're just going to keep incrementing this as it goes up in value. So it'll be like, hey, we'll put in thing one, thing two, thing three, et cetera. And that can be the solution. This is, this is basically the one thing that we found on the internet uh, to do. And so it's the first thing we did. And, and one nice thing you know, that this did, it sort of solves one other problem that we had which was um, that by holding on to the Go objects in this, it'll keep them from being garbage collected because there is no mechanism other than making sure that a Go object is referring to these other objects to let Go know that, you're, that you need some type of reference to this. Like if you're using uh, something like Python, uh, it give, allows you to increment and dec decrement uh, reference counts, et cetera. But you're going to need something like this no matter what. Um, if you're doing this with Go and, and you're doing them. But th this big old map, you know, there, there are a number of problems with this big old map. Um, I think probably the biggest one is that your performance is going to be really horrible under contention with something like this. You know, it's, it's just a concurrency nightmare. If you remember, there's, there was one lock around everything. Um, which is going to be difficult. I don't know if you saw it there. You can go back and look at it. Like We had actually had a read lock and a write lock around things. Um, if you go and look on the Go issue tracker, you'll see uh, an open issue from two or three years ago about how uh, that read-write mutex doesn't scale with the number of CPUs that you'd have. Um, and uh, there's a DR, the distributed RW uh, mutex uh, uh, GitHub repo. Also has some nice numbers where it shows it about like nine or 10 cores that the performance on those readers really drops. So just in general, like, it's going to destroy your performance, right? The, these contended locks are, are going to be problematic. And that big, old, that big old map is more or less effectively going to turn your program into a single threaded type thing, right? I mean, it'll get you there, at least in terms of something that works. It won't panic. It won't seg fault on you. But uh, it's not going to take you very far. So, the, the next thing we did was we were like, oh, OK, let's shard this sucker. Because, well, I hope that's everybody's first thought. I, I don't want to feel like I'm, you know, like, oh, yes, sharding. But that's, you know, my answer to everything when I got a contention problem. First thing, let's try sharding it. So um, we wrote this thing called concurrent map. Uh, which is basically a really nice way of saying what we want to do is we, instead of having one lock, we want to have many, many, many locks. Uh, there's an example of, of this. We're not even an example. There's in the sync package in the Go standard library, there's a sync.map, which um, will also do a concurrent map type thing for you. Um, I'll talk a little bit about why we didn't use that uh, later on. So, uh, I had to break up the code so it would fit under two slides. But this is, this is our first basic part of it. And if you're doing something like this, the first thing you really need to do is you're going to define some number of shards right? that you're going to break this up into. Um, in terms of uh, this, this 64 is from what we actually came up with after testing for like two to three weeks with our common workloads. It turned out that 64 was the best number of shards for us. Your mileage may vary. That's probably going to be one of the most important things if you want to shard your data is figuring out based on your concurrency load, how your application works, your read load, your write load, et cetera, how many shards you're going to need. Um, so then basically what we do is when we make one of these concurrent maps, what we're actually doing is for every single shard that's in there, we're creating another map that goes inside of it, right? So we have this uh, concurrent map shared is what I called it. Um, I'm, I'm not great at naming things. When I can't think of, of, of what to name something, I just call it free candy um, so that it'll stand out during a code review. That actually got all the way through to code review as being called free candy. And then finally, we just started to call it shared. It's probably a bad name. I, yeah, I'm not good with naming things. Um, right? And 
this is what we're actually creating down here. Like it's, this is like a shrunk down version of our big old map, except we no longer have any sort of ID creation in here. Instead, we have still our uint64 to interface, and then we have a read-write mutex that we would end up using in the exact same way that we did before for you know when we're going to insert stuff into it, we're going to get a write lock. When we want to read stuff from it, we're going to get a read lock there. And then when we actually want to go and we want to read something from it. If you look at like, the beginning of each one of these things, you'll see the first thing we do is on, is on this we're going to call get shard, and we're going to take whatever our key is, and we're going to find the shard, which is basically it's which one of these maps is the map that actually our key is actually in. And the idea for this is that we can then have, depending on your workload, we could in theory have up to 64 things, all of which are trying to read or write from this, which are not contending on any locks, right? That would be the idea of what we have there, right? And you know, you might have you'd have something like this. So if our ID is zero, right, then this is going to go to shard zero. Um, if we have eight shards total, then when we have like ID twelve, it's going to go to four, etc. We're using a really simple modulus for this, um, but it's something that should work, right? Which then leads us to the question of what do we do here for uh, ID generation, right? Um, and well, we could, we could start with something that's an awful lot like, you know, our, our big old map uh, one, like, like this, an, an ID generator. And this is actually the, the first thing I did just to get it working, um, right, where we just slap a mutex around the entire thing and we still do the same incrementing that we had before. This was a first step uh, that we did. And again, hey, it's working. And performance improved a little, but, you know, there's, there's still a lot of problems with this, this implementation. There's, uh, there's that lock in our ID generator, which is going to end up being a source of contention again. Um, so how can we get rid of that lock, right? Is there a way that we can ditch it? Fortunately, you know, uh, Go has a wonderful library called uh, uh, the Atomic Stuff, which is in the standard library, which provides us with some uh, more concurrency-friendly stuff. How many people know what atomic operations are? OK, that's most folks, but not everybody. So the basic idea of, of an atomic operation right, is if you look at this, this is, this is a replacement of that code using um, an atomic. The idea for an atomic operation is, is that we can do some sort of manipulation on a few basic data types, like, uh, like integers, for example, where we can both uh, increment the value of the thing. We can add something to it. Like in this case, we're adding one to it, and get what the previous value back was from it in a single operation so that we don't have to lock this. Um, Atomics still have a little bit of fun, like CPU-ness with memory gates and things around it, but it's much, much, much less expensive than setting up a full mutex and everything. So if we go ahead and we do something like this, we're going to end up with a concurrent map, which is, which is much better in terms of, of your scalability and performance. So a few things you know, that I would, I would give as recommendations for anybody who's traveling down this um, is to, for ID generation, make sure you're using something from the Atomics package. Avoid locks. Or even better, if you can, have the value be something that's intrinsic to the particular thing which you're using as a key already. Right? Like, um, if you knew, for example, that this thing was never going to move in memory, like, you could use the actual address of this thing. Of course, the whole reason why we're doing all of this is that, is that the garbage collector might someday move stuff, so that wouldn't be particularly safe. But the thing you're storing in there might be an object which has its own, like, has its own ID, and you, you're only putting things of that type in there. There are a variety of ways that you could go about doing it. But the other thing you want to make sure um, when you come up with these IDs is that however you're doing the sharding, however you're then taking those the key and hashing it to a value, you're going to want to make sure that that kind of evenly distributes stuff for your workload. Otherwise, you're going to be right back to the problem. Um, years ago, um, I worked at this company where there was this thing where we had to populate this giant hash map uh, when, the, when, the, uh, when an application started up. And I rewrote a whole bunch of it and got like, it down from like 20 minutes down to like two minutes in order to load this thing up and was very proud of myself, et cetera, and everything. And everything was great for like six months. And then suddenly, the applications started taking hours uh, 
for it to load up. And this turned out to be that the, uh, that the, um, the library um, that we were using that came out of Google, it was a Java library, there was a, there was a, there was a slight change in the uh, hashing algorithm. And almost all of, our, all of our keys were strings instead of integers. And all of a sudden, they were all hashing into this tiny little range. And it was just a big, giant uh, kerfuffle. I guess. Um, it did not work out well. So very much like if you're, if you're going to go down this sharding route, then you'd want to take, take a look and thinking about that. Also, um, realistically, map for most people is probably not going to be the right thing. Like we've so far have stopped at map, but like something like a radix tree in our particular use case would actually be a much better data structure. And we would put one in, but the, our, our performance is currently dominated by that to-do. So it doesn't really matter at this point. We could make any other improvements that we wanted to, and things wouldn't get any better, right? So that concurrent map, I got, I got links to it later on. Don't go actually use our concurrent map. It's probably not what you want. Well, you could use it. It can get you started, but it's probably not what you want. And the other, rec another recommendation is consider your performance up front, right? Like, there are an awful lot of things about, like, Seago with the overhead and what you're going to have to do where you're not going to be able to, like, in general, with performance critical code, right? It's hard to like refactor your way into code that actually gets the performance characteristics that you want. Um, it requires thought in general to write performance critical code. Um, it's even harder um, if you're coming in and you haven't played around a lot with Seago and you don't actually understand what the impact of things that, if you at least if you're like me, you would be really surprised by like. Oh my God! I can't believe that it takes you know a couple milliseconds in order to do this function call, right? And this isn't really a Seago thing, but it's it's any performance critical thing. It's just don't use locks. Anytime you put a lock in there, um, you're doing something bad. And the extension of this is that um, an awful lot of the Go uh, standard library has locks spread all all through it, like. Uh, gob, the uh, serializer, which is in the standard library. There's a point where there's a, there's a lock that everything has to go through in there when you're serializing stuff. I was certainly surprised when I found that. Like, like actually, if you're, if you're using like, this stuff in code where you're trying to like, get this concurrency and you're building a data structure to do this, just, or you're, like, you're, or you, you know, you're, you're putting this code like, inside of the stuff and everything, just check to see, like, are there locks and what there are there, right? So um, I have a few minutes left. Uh, when I got to this point on Sunday with putting together the slides, I was like, oh my god, I have no ending. I have no ending. I've just gotten up here and told people some stuff about, like, stuff I learned about Seago. And hopefully somebody someday will be, like, watching this talk on the internet going, oh, that's what I have to do, which would be really great. But I think there are some things there that uh, folks who are here or folks who um, in general could do to help the Seago story. Just one, documentation is sorely needed. Um, there isn't much of it. Like, you spend a lot of time like looking around. You might find a blog post here or there. There's not a lot of it. Um, like I've been hanging out in the 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 Seago uh, channel on the Gopher Slack for several months now, and like people keep coming in with the same questions that happen over and over again. Like there's in in the actual official Go documentation, there are two ways that are, you're told that you can actually work with Seago in terms of like if you want to create a library and you want to be able to call it from another one. I don't think I've seen anybody who's been able to figure out how one of the two things is actually supposed to work. And, and I don't think anybody like actually knows like is the documentation wrong? Is everybody just reading it wrong, et cetera? And this is like a general problem that's there with, with Seago. I mean, this is a really potentially powerful tool that will allow Go programmers to leverage like years and years and years, decades of like C code, for example, and or be able to have like build libraries that are in Go, which can be used outside of like like the Go ecosystem as well. And the documentation is just, you know. It's, it's not really there. I mean, most of the time it felt like, you know, I was practicing some sort of black arts where I was trying to, like, read these cryptic things which had left been, been left behind by people who came there. And, you know, so 
I've actually, like, over the course of time now, I've met a number of people who are using Seago. Um, I, didn't, I had no idea any of them were using Seago. I don't think that most of the people who are using Seago really talk about using Seago all that much. I don't think they talk about the pain that they go through of using Seago. I, I was here on the first day when they had the, hey, here's the process that improvements happen in Go. And one of them was, oh, people talking about the pain like, that they have with using a particular thing. And like, if, if people don't like, get up and give talks and talk about how, like, hey, this is really difficult to do, et cetera, then there would be, never be any momentum to improve this. And I think that this could be, you know, could be you know, a really powerful thing. And yeah, the Seago experience, at least in terms of tooling, it kind of sucks. It really does. The, the Seago is not Go is completely true on that. Um, but, I think that if there, there are folks who are using, like, if there are folks who are using Seago, um, I'm sure there are some folks who've, like, built some type of tools that they have around it which can make this a more pleasurable, more pleasurable experience. I mean, it's not going to, it's probably never going to be great, but it could be better. So it'd be great to see, like, people, like, releasing, like, whatever those tools are, you know, in order to try and make this better. Even this, this is just like, hey, here's my basic make file which you can use to try and make this better, right? And a, a completely selfish one, um, if, you're, if you're somebody who can actually do that to-do that's on um, uh, 1771 there in runtime.proc, I would love you because it would make my life so much better. I could go back to like making things run faster again inside of our stuff instead of looking at it going, when I have some time, I'll dive in and really understand what's needed in order to implement this stuff. So, um, yeah, that's, that's basically... Uh, Basically, what I have, I, I want to thank Brian, who, without whom I wouldn't have done this. He, he, like, he was reviewing the first couple of blog posts that I wrote about this and was just like, I, I really like this. You should submit a talk on this. Um, like, we don't have a lot of people talking about that. Also, uh, my con colleague, uh, Andrew Turley, um, who has been the other person who has been like, traveling through all of this. He's also, I think you could call him a C programmer. So we had many of the, oh, what is going on together. Um, and really, an especially big thanks to uh, Jeff Wendling. I've never met him before other than on the, uh, the Seago uh, Slack channel there. Uh, he goes by Zebo. Um, when I first found that, uh, that uh, line 1771, the issue that would, would lead to that, um, he went out of his way to spend time actually trying out, verifying that what I was seeing made sense. And then he dove into the runtime and, and pointed me in two or three different directions and said, I think you should start here and start there. And that was the first time I actually cracked open the, uh, the Go runtime code. And probably without that, like, I don't know, I think he, it was probably 10, 15 minutes of his time where he knew it much better than me, I probably would have spent three or four weeks getting to the point of where I would have been just by him like really pointing that out to me. So wherever you are, Jeff, thank you very much. That was absolutely awesome. Um, there are links to almost everything that I actually talked about in this um, here at this GitHub repo that I have. Um, lots of stuff. The slides for the talk are there, et cetera. So yeah. Please go have at it. There's, there's the few limited number of learning Seago resources that I know about. If you know of more that are there, please open PRs so I can add them. Uh, that would be great. Um, and thank you very much.